It's been seven months now since the indigenous mass grave story broke and not one body has been exhumed. Not one. Seven months, flags at half mast, thousands of articles, promises of investigation, an entire national holiday created, Canada Day canceled, protests in the streets, $27 million allocated to locating and memorializing these graves, dozens of churches burnt to the ground forever and vandalized, the UN calling for an investigation into human rights violations, and Amnesty International calling for prosecutions. Yet, not one body has been exhumed. And yes, I would like to think, based off of all of the impacts I have just listed, we can all agree that confirmation of this story does matter. It matters if the burials are maybe burials or actual real burials, and it is worthwhile to ask why, after all of this attention, money, political interest, and time, there has been no action taken. Well, at last, we may have some sort of explanation. Why? Last week, retired professor, I am going to pronounce his name wrong, Jacques Rouillard. Oh my god, I cannot do French names. <laughs> Jacques Rouillard. Jacques Rouillard <laughs> from the University of Montreal's History Department published a deep dive investigation into the mass grave story. And it is pretty shocking just how much this guy rejects the mainstream narrative, especially considering Rouillard is a highly distinguished academic in his field with an expertise in Canadian history, particularly the 19th and 20th century. I mean, so often you will get into these arguments online on Twitter, or you'll see a mainstream media article where someone is claiming to be a doctor in their profile, ranting at you about how obesity doesn't exist or some shit. And then you look them up and you find out they've actually got a PhD in Buffy studies or something, which it exists. Don't ask me how I know this, but anyways, it's just nice to, for once, at last, have someone who actually knows what they are talking about write an article on a subject and actually have it get shares. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the man started by opening his essay aghast at how the media and public decided to react to what is an unconfirmed preliminary report. Who would have thought an academic would, uh, would want a bit of skepticism and caution when approaching such a subject? But let's get into it. After seven months of recrimination and denunciation, where are the remains of the children buried at the Kamloops Indian Residential School? The huge media story last summer grew out of the scanning of part of the site in the British Columbia interior where the school operated from 1890 to 1978. The discovery was first reported last May 27 by Tekemlep's First Nation chief, Roseanne Casimir, after an anthropologist, Sarah Bellio, used ground-penetrating radar in a search for the remains of children alleged by some to be buried there. She is a young anthropologist, an instructor in anthropology and sociology at the University of Fraser Valley since 2018. I went to UFV. Although it's not a particularly distinguished school, so I do wonder if the, <laughs> this is a bit of an academic derogatory remark he's making here. Anyways, her preliminary report is actually based on depressions and abnormalities in the soil of an apple orchard near the school, not exhumed remains. By never pointing out that it is only a matter of speculation or potentiality and that no remains have yet been found, governments and the media are simply granting credence to what is really a thesis – the thesis of the disappearance of children from residential schools, from an allegation of cultural genocide endorsed by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have moved to physical genocide, a conclusion that the commission explicitly rejects in its report. And all of this is based only on soil abnormalities that could easily be caused by root movements, as the anthropologist herself cautioned in a July 15th press conference. Now, these first few paragraphs is all stuff I've reported on already, but this professor takes his analysis further, as the unsubstantiated claim of mass graves is, quite frankly, just a symptom of a larger crisis in Canada. That being the fact that 99% of people who discuss residential schools and Indigenous issues here have not once, ever, glanced at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a massive body of works published in 2015, collecting data, first-hand stories, excavations, archaeological information, government files, letters, and professional historical analysis, everything that could possibly be dug up on residential schools, the Catholic Church, the Canadian government, and their relations with the Indigenous community, in one place. 
Riyard, unlike most people who will probably be offended by his article, has clearly actually read the TRC and has some serious issues with the way that the public and press present its data, stating that potential misreadings of this data may have contributed to the overwhelming unsubstantiated belief that children disappeared into mass graves. So let's unpack that. In its 2015 report, the TRC identified 3,200 deaths of children at residential schools. Surprisingly, it was unable to record the names of one-third of the children, or of half the cause of death. According to Volume 4 of the report, there are significant limitations in both the quality and quantity of the data the Commission has been able to compile on residential school deaths. In fact, each trimester, school principals reported the names of students attending school to be funded by the government and specified the names of any students who had died. But in many cases, the report says, school principals simply reported on the number of children who had died in the previous year without identification, or they might give a total of the number of students who had died since a specific school opened, but with no identification of the name, year, or cause of death. The commission included all these unnamed students in the total of student deaths. That means that student deaths could have been counted twice, both in the trimester report by the principal and in the general compilation with no names. The commission admitted that this possibility exists and that some of the deaths recorded in the named register might also be included in the unnamed register. This obviously biased method inflates greatly the number of missing students and the actual state of knowledge surrounding their deaths, and this flawed information is what lies at the root of the assumption that any unnamed students disappeared without their parents being informed, and that the schools crudely buried them in mass graves. I can hear the cries now in the distance. What is this man implying? This is denialism, I tell you, Lauren. I'm sorry, but if you feel that way, you're just stupid. (laughs) This potential data gap is acknowledged in the TRC, a document compiled by pro-Indigenous experts, bands, and survivors themselves using all of the available information and millions of dollars of resources. Once again, unlike seemingly every mainstream media source in Canada, this professor actually decided to do the reading and went into the archives surrounding the Kamloops residential school deaths. Which brings us to why we may have not seen any exhumation yet, and may never. At the Kamloops Residential School, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, NCTR, officially recorded the names of 51 children who died from 1915 to 1964. We have been able to find information on these children from the records in Library and Archives Canada and from death certificates held by the British Columbia Archives Genealogy Resource Online, which it seems was not consulted by NCTR researchers. Combining these two sources provides a good picture of the deaths of at least 35 of the 49 students, two are duplicates. 17 died in hospital, eight on their own reserves as a result of illness or accidents, Four were the subject of autopsies and seven of coroner inquests. As for burial sites, 24 are buried in their home Indian Reserve Cemetery and four at the Kamloops Indian Reserve Cemetery. For the rest of the 49 children, information is either missing or requires that the complete death certificate in the BC Vital Statistics Agency be consulted. This is a far cry from the unverified claim that authorities overlooked or somehow covered up their deaths, or that the parents were not informed or the remains never returned home. Most were informed and most were returned home. Significantly, the Kamloops Residential School is located at the heart of the Kamloops Reserve itself. A fact that is never reported by Aboriginal spokespersons or the media. The TRC report states that schools were virtually all church-run in the early years of the system, and Christian burial was the norm at most schools. Also, the adjoining church cemetery may be used as a burial ground for students who die at the school, as well for members of the local community and the missionaries themselves. This is what happened in Kamloops. Our research shows that four students are buried in the band cemetery on the reserve that is located near St. Joseph's Church, not far from the residential school. With the cemetery so close by, is it really credible that the remains of 200 children were buried clandestinely in a mass grave, on the reserve itself, without any reaction from the band council until last summer? 
Chief Casimir states that the presence of children's remains had been known in the community for a long time. Aboriginal families are certainly as concerned about the fate of their children as any other community. Why did they say nothing? Moreover, how can one think that entire groups of religious men and women dedicated to high moral standards could conspire to commit such sordid crimes without dissent and not even a single whistleblower? Riyar goes on to make many points I made in my film, uh, The Canadian Mass Graves Hoax, like highlighting how the Cowessus site of allegedly 751 unmarked children's graves was actually just a Catholic cemetery of the mission in Maryville. He discusses how wooden graves were used by both First Nations communities and also poor Catholics, white or indigenous, and how said grave markers would quickly crumble. I've actually spent some time reading the TRC myself, and apparently there are missing grave sites just 30 minutes away from where I grew up in Langley. But it didn't seem the media cared to kick up a fuss about those ones. Perhaps it's because there were white people buried there too? This is volume four of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, page 119 on burials and missing graves. For example, the cemetery at the Roman Catholic St. Mary's Mission near Mission British Columbia was intended originally for priests and nuns from the mission as well as for students from the residential school. Three oblate bishops were buried there along with settlers, their descendants, and residential school students. When the Battleford School closed in 1914, Principal E. Matheson reminded the Indian Affairs Office that there was a school cemetery that contained the bodies of 70 to 80 individuals, most of whom were former students. He worried that unless the government took steps to care for the cemetery, it would be overrun by stray cattle. Matheson had good reason for wishing to see the cemetery maintained. Several of his family members were buried there. These concerns proved prophetic since the location of this cemetery is not recorded in the available historical documentation, and neither does it appear in an internet search of Battleford cemeteries. The fact that there were a bunch of white people buried there did not seem to change the government's neglect of old graves, and I don't think any of us would assume that the loss of this site means those white people were murdered and their deaths deliberately covered up. My point being, even if there were an exhumation of actual bodies discovered at Kamloops, and that's an if, we still don't know, after seven months, it is not out of the ordinary for historical grave sites, whether they be for white or indigenous people, to go missing. In fact, this whole planet is one giant mass of unmarked graves. And until there is any archaeological investigation of the circumstances, any proof of exhumation or identification, none of the claims the media have been making should have been made, and every month that goes by without any evidence is further vindication of those of us who remain skeptical. It is wild to see how people have reacted to this story. I got cancelled from speaking at a top university in Canada by both students and staff, an institution that is supposed to be dedicated to finding truth and observing actual data, for making the exact same analysis that the TRC itself made. That the actual data states. That the actual woman who conducted the GPR test states. And now, what this professor of history is highlighting. And you know, I read my comments and I see people in there who have been affected by this issue. I see the indigenous people who make comments saying, yeah, residential schools were a mess. It is a tragedy what happened to my people. So don't make it a damn circus. You don't need to lie to talk about our history. And I respect that attitude so much. I will just end with this last quote from Ruyard's piece, which I will also link in the description down below because the full thing is excellent. Um, it is hard to believe that a preliminary search for an alleged cemetery or mass grave in an apple orchard on reserve land near the residential school of Kamloops could have led to such a spiral of claims endorsed by the Canadian government and repeated by mass media all over the world. It gives a terrible and simplistic impression of complex issues in Canadian history. The exhumations have not yet begun, and no remains have obviously been found. Imaginary stories and emotion have outweighed the pursuit of truth. On the road to reconciliation isn't the best way to seek and tell the whole truth, rather than deliberately create sensational myths.